Did you see the Neuralink presentation this week? Elon Musk just rolled out the first demonstration of his brain interface. Did you see this? Okay, I am gonna give you guys an edited summary of the presentation because I think it's fascinating. I'm absolutely fascinated by what's going on with this technology and in this space. So essentially, Neuralink is a device that Elon Musk and his team have devised and they're working on this long-term to make an efficient, operable device that goes in your skull. They take out a piece of your skull, they put in this device, it's like a Fitbit, in your brain with wires, little wires that go throughout your cortex and throughout your brain, and it can read and write electrical signals to your brain. This is a phenomenal advance in technology, and what they're doing is creating a robot that will surgically implant this into your brain. So, sci-fi? Have we arrived in this new Skynet universe? It is just unbelievable to me the kind of advances that Elon is able to make. I mean, if you look all the way back from Zip to it, to PayPal, to SpaceX, to Tesla, to SolarCity, and now with Neuralink, is, does anybody want to bet against this guy? What he's proposing is absolutely mind-blowing. And stick around to the end of his presentation and you will hear from his own mouth behind a mask what his long-term predictions are for this technology. And it is truly revolutionary. All right, welcome to the Neuralink product demo. I'm really excited to show you what we've got. I think it's gonna blow your mind. Our goal is to solve important spine and brain problems with a seamlessly, seamlessly implant, implanted device. But all of, these, the, the, all of your senses, your sight, hearing, feeling, um, pain, uh, these are all electrical signals sent by neurons to your brain. And if you can uh, correct these signals, you can solve everything from memory loss, hear, memory loss, hearing loss, blindness, paralysis, depression, insomnia, extreme pain, seizures, anxiety, addiction, strokes, brain damage. These can all be solved with Neuralink. You open a piece of skull, um, you remove uh, about a coin-sized piece of skull, uh, and then the robot inserts the electrodes. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, then the device replaces the portion of skull that was removed, and we, we basically close that up with actually super glue, which is how a lot of wounds are closed. And, uh, and then you can just walk around right, after, right afterwards. It's pretty cool. Um, so this, this shows you um, at sort of a close-up view, uh, which I think is actually not too gruesome, uh, of the electrodes being inserted in the brain. And if you look closely, you'll see that um, that's a, it's a little counterintuitive that uh, if the electrodes are inserted very carefully, that there is no bleeding. Um, and so the... Uh, if you have very tiny electrodes, and if they're inserted very carefully, so that the robot actually images the brain and makes sure to avoid any veins or arteries, so that the electrodes can be inserted um, with no noticeable damage. So you will have no noticeable uh, neural damage uh, in inserting the link. Does it actually work? And uh, what I'm excited to show you, um, I call it like the, the three little pigs demo, um, and. Gertrude, thanks for coming out. Um, so what you're, the, the beeps you're hearing are real-time signals from the neural link in Gertrude's head. So this neural link connects to neurons that are uh, in her snout. So whenever she snuffles around and touches something with her snout, the, that sends out uh, neural spikes, which are detected here. Um, and so on the screen, um, you can see uh, each, each of the, the spikes from the 1,024 electrodes. And, and then if, you, if she, yeah, she snuffles around, touches this knot in the ground, or you kind of feed her some food, pigs love food, um, then uh, you, you can see the neurons um, will fire much more than when you're not touching this knot. And uh, that's what's making the, the beeping sound. Now, in terms of, of writing to the brain or stim stimulating neurons, uh, we obviously need pr precise control of the electric field in, in space and time. We need a wide range of current for different brain regions. Uh, some, some regions require delicate stimulation, some require a lot of current, uh, and, and you want obviously no harm to the brain over time. Um, and the way we, um, part of the way we analyze the, 
the stimulate, stimulating neurons uh, is with a two-photon uh, microscopy. I, I always have trouble pronouncing that microscopy. Um, and uh, it's very impressive technology. You can actually literally see in real time uh, how the neurons are firing. So uh, the, the red sort of things are the neurons, the red, red sort of flashing things are the neurons uh, firing. Or I should say the, uh, uh, the electrodes firing. So the red things are electrodes firing, and then the green are the neuron bodies responding to uh, the current from the electrode. So our, our first clinical trial is aimed at uh, people with paraplegia or, or tetraplegia, uh, so cervical spinal cord injury. We're going to enroll, uh, we're planning to enroll a small number of patients uh, to make sure the device is safe and that it works in that case. I think something that's very exciting as a long-term application is if you, can, if you can sense what somebody is trying to do with their limbs, what they want to do with their limbs, um, then you can actually uh, uh, do a second implant that's at the base of the spine or, or wherever, just after wherever the spinal injury occurred, and you can, you can create a neural shunt. Uh, so we, I, I think long-term, I'm confident that long-term uh, it will be possible to restore somebody's full body motion. So if somebody even has a severed spine, they will be able to walk again. They will be able to use their hands. Um, and like when you have a severed spinal cord, you essentially have a broken, broken wires. Um, and so if, if you can just jump over those wires and transmit the singles, signals over those wires, uh, you can give somebody uh, the ability to walk again, naturally. And what he's talking about are wires going throughout your brain that are less than 1 20th the thickness of a human hair. That's just to start. That's just version one. He's already thinking toward the future where we have exponential improvements by a factor of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Can you imagine where we're going to be in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? What kind of a brave new world are we entering? Will you be able to save and replay memories in the future? Essentially, if, if you have a whole brain interface, everything that's encoded in memory, you could... Uh, you could upload, you could basically store your memories um, as a backup and restore the memories. Um, and ultimately, you could potentially download them into a new body or into a robot body. The future is going to be weird. <laughs> They're wondering, can this device be used to explain consciousness? In the long term, of course. I can, I can get, certainly shed some light on, on consciousness. This is, this is a really interesting question. I, I think the answer is yes. And I think one of the reasons that consciousness is so hard is because like anything in physics, you're looking at a mapping from X to Y, where X is the neuronal correlate, it's the thing that's happening then physically, and then Y is this phenomenal state. And historically, we've been unable to observe the neuronal correlates very well. And unless it's in you, we've been unable to observe the phenomenal state. So as soon as you were able, neuroscientists are able to personally get these tools where they can see the correlates and they can have the experience, I think the hard problem will vanish very quickly. What does that do from an ethical standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from a standpoint of what is the world going to be like? What kind of new questions are going to be raised? What kind of new discoveries are we going to be confronted with? My, my background is in visual neuroscience. And uh, one of the things I think has great potential for the Neuralink is to provide a visual prosthesis for people who have retinal injury or blindness through eye injury. You can essentially uh, plug a camera directly into the visual cortex and stimulate with an enormous array of thousands or maybe tens of thousands of electrodes to recreate a, a visual image. And in time, perhaps, you can use that same technology in people who haven't lost vision to produce some kind of heads-up display, um, something like uh, Terminator or something like that. <laughs> Wonderful. In, in fact, it's worth saying that like, over time, we could actually give somebody supervision. Uh, like you could have like, uh, ultraviolet or infrared uh, or see in radar, basically name your frequency. Um, and you, and you can just dynamically adjust the sensor or have sensors that feed into the visual cortex across a wide range of, of frequencies and, act, and actually have uh, superhuman vision. Yeah, so for me, uh, telepathy. So I think it's an um, incredible <laughs> amount of effort to put your thoughts into a set of words and you know, it comes out completely compressed. So being able to do that seamlessly without being able to compress it with all of the mechanisms would be great.
Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like just a, I'm sorry, to add further to that. Um, um, in fact, when I did the Wait But Why article, um, I, um, I think t Tim thought I said consensual telepathy, um, but I said conceptual telepathy. <laughs> I would presume it would be consensual, um, uh, because you definitely don't want just p people, you know, s sending stuff into your brain without your consent. But um, a, a lot of our uh, brain uh, thought capacity is go goes into uh, compressing our thoughts into words. Um, and then you think of like the, the, the data rate of words. Words are a very slow, very low data rate. And, and we're putting a tremendous amount of mental energy into compressing the concepts and thoughts in our head into words and then slowly talking. Speech is so very, very slow. And uh, we could actually send um, the, the true thoughts. That we could basically have far better communication because we can convey the actual concepts, the actual thoughts uncompressed to somebody else. So non-linguistic consensual and conceptual <laughs> yes, telepathy. <but> exactly. <laughs> Non-linguistic non consen consensual conceptual telepathy. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I think we have an incredible opportunity to limit human suffering to a tiny fraction of what it is today uh, in all kinds of different avenues. Pain uh, being the essence of suffering, we might be able to control that finally. Uh, and so many other diseases, so much other um, suffering in the world. I think the Neuralink device could help a lot with. Amazing. Um, I, I think all these things are, are great uh, functions for a neural Neuralink. Um, I think on, on, a, on a species level basis, I think it's going to be important for us to figure out um, how we uh, coexist with advanced artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, I think have, achieving some kind of AI symbiosis uh, where you have an AI extension of yourself, uh, like a tertiary layer above the limbic system and cortex, um, and uh, and having that having that symbiosis be good, such that the future of the world is controlled by the a combined will of the people of, of Earth. I think that that's obviously going to be the future that we want, presumably, is if it's the sum of our collective will, and um, and so I think it's it's going to be important from a, from an existential threat standpoint to achieve um, a, a good AI symbiosis and that's uh, what I think is m m might be the, the most important thing that a device like this achieves. I'm fascinated by the ethical and, and moral questions surrounding this as well. What does it mean to have a species merged with a computer technology into sort of this universal sentient conscience? <sighs> It's fascinating. I, I mean, I'm just starting to get my head around what even this all means or looks like. So I'm very curious to hear from you. Leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think about where we're headed, what this technology means. Will you get one? Will you wait? What happens if somebody can afford one and somebody can't? Do you have a superhuman that now all of a sudden can, can get a job or, or get promoted faster? And what happens if you choose not to get one? Are you going to be ostracized and... and essentially shunned from the community because you can't keep up with everybody else. The possibilities and the questions and the what ifs, are, they just seem to be innumerable. And guys, do me a favor. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. I'm really interested in discussing these things with you guys. So leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel if you want to talk about more of this stuff. I'm really interested in this merge of technology, intelligence, the brain, gaming, how the future of entertainment works within all of this, how relationships work back and forth between people with this new technology and communications. Do you think telepathy is going to be a real thing? So like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.